right, we are continuing reading Have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. Wild in the Streets, May 25th, 2014. Imagine that a group of armed men run into a business, rob it of $100,000 and change, sexually assault a woman, and even steal food from them before vanishing. What would you call them? What would the news media call them? Some years ago, in Philadelphia, young people would rush into stores downtown, enter in large numbers, and rip off clothes and sneakers, fleeing amid mass confusion. The media called them, quote, flash mobs, end quote, and public commentary denounced them as, quote, animals, end quote, quote, savages, end quote, and, quote, criminals, end quote. Politicians rushed the mic to condemn them and promise swift and terrible retribution for such, quote, unacceptable, end quote, acts. When some of the kids got arrested sometime later, judges spat sentences of contempt and time at them. Remember the first group? They were city cops, narcs. They hit local bodegas and cut wires to security cameras before robbing Latin American business owners. <clears throat> what were they called by politicians, prosecutors, and the press? Quote, officers, end quote. These events happened several years ago. After years of, quote, investigations, end quote, guess what happened? Not much. Sure, a few of the perpetrators, cops, got fired, but no charges were filed. And in the absence of charges, some, perhaps all, will get their jobs back with back pay. No harm done. Quote, There's nothing to see here. Keep it moving. End quote. In New York, some names ring like bells. Romarley Graham, Amadou Diallo, Sean Bell. Injustice after injustice after injustice. And politicians, especially black politicians, are as silent as church mice. <clears throat> this is not random, nor is it mere happenstance. This is institutional. This is systemic. And this goes deeper than we know. Over a generation ago, when police bombed the home of MOVE members in Philadelphia, they set a precedent. It was a precedent of impunity, a crystal clear example of state terrorism. The violence and the impunity has spread like cancer, and it impacts every black and brown community in the country. And when people were silent about the carnage deployed by police against the black families in the MOVE neighborhood, they subtly gave the green light for such violence to openly continue. The wave of violent repression that has rippled out since, one which has no precedent in American history, continues to drown out the lives of black families and communities. We must unite to build a movement to end police violence and the prison industrial complex that criminalizes communities of color once and for all. And so that's the end of that passage. Uh, this is the first time uh, also that I'm hearing about the these narcs that were in that were uh, robbing local bodegas. Uh, and, and flash mobs have been something that have been a, a staple. And, and part of the lexicon within the society, you know, these last for these last years. So this is, you know, I've I haven't heard of this specific flash mob that they were talking about, uh, but <clears throat> we've seen flash mobs take place uh, regularly. Uh, and so these are these are both, you know, passages about you know one thing that I was smallly informed about, and then another thing that I was uh, not informed about, and then. Uh, again, Mamiya Abu Jamal harkens back to the bombing of the home in Philadelphia of the MOVE members, and which is, you know, one of the most uh, egregious acts of police terrorism, of macroaggressions of police terrorism, which have taken place in uh, in in American society, and it's also one that is very little known. <clears throat> I think one of the other things that's important again here is. Uh, Mami Abu Jamal continues to tie the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration into uh, the the issues of police terrorism and uh, continues to remind us that both of these things must be 
tackled simultaneously. And uh, I think that that is, again, one of the things that uh, is, is high on the order for importance of the May 30th alliance. A cop shot 18-year-old Michael Brown eight times. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. A cop shot 18-year-old Michael Brown eight times. August 11th, 2014. Once again, an unarmed black youth has been killed by a cop. And while the facts surrounding the shooting are presently unclear, what is clear is that a cop shot 18-year-old Michael Brown eight times. According to at least one eyewitness, police killed Brown as he stood with his hands up in the air. To anyone familiar with American history, this is not a rarity. Such atrocities occur as a result of systematic function of police across the country to track, target, and repress the nation's black population. <clears throat> that has been the case for generations. And as indignation and outrage arise in black hearts in response to outrageous treatment, we see voices trotted out to call for calm. Never do those calling for calm become voices calling for true justice, for justice is equality, and who dares demand that cops be treated like the people that they oppress or that the oppressed be treated with the same dignity and respect as everyone else? Americans of color seem to have no influence over the repressive forces, and in fact, no political office in America does. They have been bought off, paid off, or both. Listen to the voices of politicians of any color. Listen to the raging silence. Needed in the suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri, and in every black community in America, are independent and uncompromising black revolutionary collectives determined to protect the lives and well-being of black people, period. Existing political structures, silent in the face of perpetual violence, have failed us and cannot be made to serve our interests. It's time to learn from this and build for our future necessities. Ferguson's real, quote, outside agitators, end quote. August 19, 2014. As the days and nights of angry resistance rage on in Ferguson, Missouri, the corporate media embarks on its newest campaign, the proposed banning of, quote, outside agitators, end quote. It is ironic in the extreme to hear black reporters, black cops, and even black activists launch verbal attacks against, quote, outside agitators, end quote, for the phrase, quote, outside agitators, end quote, was born in the minds and mouths of white Southern segregationists. It was these racists who used the term to denounce the arrival of students from the North who organized to register voters, start freedom schools, and support the freedom riders to break state segregation laws. <clears throat> Remember Martin L. King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference? When it stays marches in Alabama, that state's governor, George Wallace, called the organization's members, quote, professional agitators with pro-communist affiliations, end quote. Sound familiar? How close to, quote, outside agitators, end quote. The phrase begs the question, outside of what? The state? America? This country is called the United States of America, founded upon a national constitution. Do all citizens have the right to protest or just some? Is what happened to Mike Brown a local matter or is his unjustifiable killing actually a national issue? It's not the job of media to police protests deciding who are, quote, good demonstrators, end quote, and who are, quote, bad, end quote, ones. Their job is to report what is happening, period. Were it not for these protests, let us be frank, the mass media would have ignored the crimes police committed against Michael Brown, against his family, against his community, and against his fellow citizens, us. If media were doing their job, reporting on the vicious violence launched against young blacks the nation over, perhaps Michael Brown would be alive today. Let us look at the cops, almost 98% of whom are outsiders to Ferguson. They work there, they kill there, but they don't live there. They dwell in neighboring, wider counties and towns. Who are the real outside agitators? 
And so as we end that passage, I think that one of the things I want to point out is the similarities to what we seen on May 30th and on May 30th, 2020 in Rockford, Illinois, when people who were outside of District 1 and people who uh, partook in the protest and some of the in the uprising, the, the mini uprising, the small uprising that took place in Rockford, Illinois, uh, they were deemed outside agitators by the chief of police, uh, Dan O'Shea. They were deemed to be, uh, they, you know, they talked about how uh, they seen people with out-of-state plates and video cameras. And uh, they used that to attribute that the people who were protesting and who were marching and who were outside of D1, whether it was uh, spray painting or tearing down the lettering or uh, uh, refusing to leave and exercising their rights to stay on this public space, they tried to use this, uh, f this saying of outside agitators to denounce the validity of the issues that were being brought forth. And again, this, this same statement that Mamiya Abu-Jamal uh, uh, writes at the end of this passage when he says that the majority of the police officers who work in Ferguson lived outside of Ferguson, that they were the real outside agitators. The same thing is true here. The, major the 80 percent of the Rockford Police Department lives outside of Rockford. So, yes, they... They police here, they kill here, but they don't live here. They live outside of here. And so uh, there were there. It was more people who was from the community of Rockford and from this area that were protesting and that were demonstrating than were policing the people protesting and demonstrating. And so, again, it begs into question, uh, who are the real outside agitators? And, and I think that. It, one of the things that has to be brought up and spoken about as well when we're correlating some of the things that happened in Ferguson with issues that we have seen happen in Rockford, Illinois, is we've seen that on May 30th when property was destroyed, when uh, uh, stores were looted, when there was a, an uprising that took place throughout the city, that there was a, a high awareness in uh, multiple tactics taken by the city government, by the institution of policing. And again, these were all, uh, these were all, none of these were genuine actions, but they still were actions nonetheless that were taken, not because somebody's life had been taken, not because uh, this issue of police violence had even manifested here in Rockford, Illinois, but because of the destruction of property, because of the fear that they had of uh, of continued resistance in the city. And so you've seen the mayor have a press conference and speak about these things and call up all of these different black figureheads to stand next to him. You've seen the police department roll out an initiative to get body cameras, which we're just now seeing manifest in 2021, even though it originated from things that happened on May 30th, 2020. We've seen the city of, of Rockford in conjunction with the Rockford Police Department have multiple town hall meetings about these issues and have uh, virtual Zoom press conferences and things of these issues. Uh, we've seen stores around the uh, uh, the specifically the Rockford Art Deli worked in what seemed to be conjunction with the city of Rockford government to release merchandise that was uh, saying Black Lives Matter and these this these things were uh, all done without anybody being shot here killed here without the macro aggression of police terrorism manifesting here but because of the uprising. Uh, exerting such pressure and leverage that these systems uh, had to act in this way. But then we seen when Tyrus Jones was shot and there was not that type of uh, of uprising in the city where there were not stores looted. There were not people outside of D1 and taking to the streets. We seen no press conference. We seen no uh, black figureheads come up to speak. We seen no T-shirts with Black Lives Matter. We seen no reaction to it. And again, when Denzel Duvant was assaulted, nothing. And then when Jose Gonzalez Jr. and Faustin Guaytigo were shot and murdered, uh, the or May 30th Alliance put together in a, a march and uh, took to the streets, and it was 50 people. Uh, so again, uh, uh, in, in that grand scheme of things, nothing. And so you, and we've seen how these institutions did not. Uh, budge or waver on these macro aggressions taking place and happening. And so a uh, conversation must be had as to uh, why we live in a society where if there are not things burning, if there are not uh, people in the streets, if there are not people uh, spray painting and, and tearing down letters, why are we lethargic to these uh, to these uh, to these uh, 
to these murders, to these injustices, to these crimes against humanity taking place? Why is uh, why are people complacent? Uh, why is it not a why does the story not stay in the news cycle or become uh, a national uh, headline or a national talking piece if people are not in the streets, if people are not uh, uh, burning and looting in some sense, if people are not uh, uprising and having uh, having that type of uh, uh, outpour? And so uh, we're still reminded the the uh, the strength and the power that exist in all of these different forms of political actions and all of these things, uh, all of these different forms of political actions have uh, been used uh, to the advantage of trying to uh, get to a more equitable society with some of these things. And so I'm uh, going to end this one here. This gets us to 15 minutes on this side and then 15 minutes on the first side. And again, we're reading through uh, Have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. Uh, this is, we're about about two thirds of the way through this. I think this is day 10, day 10. So uh, if you haven't listened to the previous episodes, please go back and listen to the previous episodes. And if you want to listen to the episodes, uh, if by the time you listen to this, there's more episodes that's out. Uh, please go listen to those and share this on whatever platform that you are listening to this on. And again, these Rafa reading dailies are done with uh, uh, to give people the opportunity to begin on their journey to struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice every day, and then to also offer the opportunity for people to further themselves on their journey to struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice every day. All right, we outside.